Okay, just before we start, a quick trigger warning. In this episode, I will be talking about violence and about some really, really extreme moments from the life of a central female character. As always, I want you to know, I never tell a story for shock value. I like to tell a story to show someone's strength, someone's courage, or maybe it's just a story that needs to be talked about. And in this case, although it is brutal at points, I hope you might find some hope and some light in the story. Well, she seemed alright by Dawn's early light. Though she looked a little worried and weak. She tried to pretend he wasn't drinking again. But the proof was on her cheek. Word gets around in a small town. But she was proud and she stood her ground. People whispered and people talked. And everybody looked the other way. But let freedom ring. Let the whole world know. The days of looking the other way are over. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. All is well. (laughs) I'm just working away on the new stories, new episodes. And pretty soon there'll be a new Patreon-only episode. So, if you want to support the podcast, you can. By going to Patreon and finding Extraordinary Stories Podcast. So, if you want to support me by sending me... Good thoughts, you can do that too. I fully appreciate that. All right, before this story, which is big, which is intense, we're just going to do a couple of quick shout outs. So, hello to Maria Montoya, who has her birthday on Monday. Happy birthday to you. I'll not sing the whole song, Maria, but you know, happy birthday when it comes. Next, Joanne Little. Ah, Joanne also. A birthday. Um, let, let's mix this up. Let's mix this up. Happy birthday to you. Right, you're getting you're getting the Stevie Wonder version. Joanne, have a nice birthday. Chelsea Hopkins Allen. Hello, Chelsea. Chelsea is an artist making gorgeous art and I'll uh, put up the link so that you can find what she does. Claire Smith, hello. Hello Claire. Thank you for being forgiving when I got my Claire's mixed up in the online world. I just got everything, I just got all the Claire's confused and I hate doing that. I hate getting anybody confused with anyone else and I, I just made a wee mistake. So... Thanks for being understanding and thank you for the vagina video that you sent me. 
Right, hang on, you filthy-minded beasts. I know what you're thinking. Claire sent me a very funny video of a Scottish woman using all the many names that we have in Scotland for a vagina. So it was nice and innocent. So when I say vagina video, keep your smutty thoughts to yourself. And lastly in the shout outs, part shout out, part apology. I made an error. I missed out saying hello to someone who is one half of a couple who listen. So I said hello to Sarah and I didn't say hello to Jess. Jess, this episode is for you. My apologies. I'm so sorry. I forgot that bit of the shout out. I'm really sorry. So, okay, shout outs over. So today's story, um, it's a well-known one and an absolutely extraordinary one. It's a story that would change history. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Francine Hughes was born in 1947 in Michigan. She was born to a mother and a father who had the kind of relationship which was very typical of the time. I mean, maybe not in every household, but certainly in a huge number of households, in a huge number of relationships. It's very reflective of the times, 1947. The role was really that the female was there to be the woman who cared for her husband and who met his every need. Men were the dominant one in the house and the women were subservient to the men. And this is how Francine's mother lived her life. And it's what she kind of instilled in her children at a very young age and into Francine. Um, Hi. Sorry. Hi. Oh yeah, I'm just getting a call from feminism from the future telling you to get your fucking act together. I mean, (laughs) I'd love to say in 2018 we've moved on dramatically. And yes, of course we have. But, you know, there's still places where those values still exist. I'd like to say, luckily, none of the women, I don't think, in my life. So I was sort of racking my brains when I was thinking about that. I was like, I don't think any of the women in my life live like that or or are subservient to men. So I know I'm wandering off, off off of the point here. Uh, yeah, so just just to sorry, <laughs> continue to wander off the point. I must just tell you this, right? So I live in a bit of Glasgow that's just I'm just maybe like a mile outside of like the hub of of uh, the west end of Glasgow, which is you know considered to be like you know the the bit where it's all happening and there's lots going on in the west end. It's very metropolitan. It's very it's really exciting. But I live in an area where years and years and years ago and we're going back a long time ago it used to be considered an area where a lot of older people would live that's not been the case for a long long time and now it's filled with young people it's filled with young professionals moving into it there's new families all the time it's a completely redeveloped changed area but there are still a few of those generation who are a bit older who still live here and I, anyway so I'm in a shop right across the road from me about maybe I don't know maybe two weeks ago and there's a woman in in front of me and she's one of these like old Glasgow women who's clearly just got old values and I hear her talking to the, the woman who's serving her and they're basically taking the piss out of a male 
member of staff because he'd done something wrong. I wasn't quite sure what it was he did, but he either like dropped something or he got something wrong or he did something. And she actually, I'm standing behind her in the queue and I heard her saying to this woman, oh, you see, that's the thing. Men, what they need is they need a good woman. They need a good woman in their life because they're absolute. Men are terrible without a good woman in their life. That's what they need. Oh, they're useless without them. Literally, my blood was boiling because I wanted to say to her, shut up. I know you're from a different generation, but it's 2018. Men are fine. Men can cope. We're okay. We can exist. Do you know what I mean? It's oh, I hate hate, hate that idea of, oh, men, they just need a good woman in their life to sort them out. Oh, fuck off. Get that idea. Get that in the bin. Get that in the bin. I'm bored of it. So bored of it. I'm also so bored, yeah, but I, I'm also incensed by the same idea that a woman needs a man. Oh, no woman needs a man. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So when I, when I hear that, Part of me gets annoyed, but also part of me goes, okay, you are of a different generation, and I get that those values were instilled in you from people who were born in the same time as Francine's parents were born. You know, the 30s, the 40s, when actually those values and those ideals existed in a family. So I can kind of forgive it on that level. It's not going to stop me being annoyed about it. Anyway... Sorry, <laughs> went way off topic. Back to Francine. She was one of six kids. And while her parents, Hazel and Walter, they did a few different jobs here and there, they didn't have a great deal of money. They were a pretty poor family. A large part of the reason that they were poor is that Walter, Francine's dad, was a bit of a drunken bum. He was a fan of having a drink and sometimes he would drink for days at a time and it meant that he just kept losing job after job and money was really tight in the family. However, all the way through this, Francine's mother, Hazel, she fills her with the idea, you just have to get on with it. That's your job as a woman. So Francine, as a youngster, she goes to school and she's very clever, Francine. All descriptions of her at the time will say she was always that child in the class who just got there a little bit quicker than the rest. She was always the one who finished the book first or completed the sums first. She was really smart. But unfortunately, she'd grown up in poverty and she'd grown up in a family where really nobody excelled academically. So great that she was smart and that she could read and that she could do all these great things with her brain. But where was that ever going to take her in life? Because as her mother had instilled in her, Your job as a woman is to make sure your man is okay. At age 15, one of her and her friends, they go to a dance in the local area. You know, one of those nice, sort of (laughs) early 60s dances. I imagine everyone looked fabulous (laughs) in their 60s get up. (laughs) And it's here that she meets a young man who is three years older than her, called Mickey Hughes. Now, Mickey, he's 18, he's got his own car, he smokes, he's a bit of a bad boy. He's a charmer with the ladies. I mean, you know the kind of person I'm describing here. And I'm literally describing John Travolta in Greece, essentially, is what I'm describing. I've just realised that as I said those words. But take John Travolta in Greece, 
and run a massive streak of evil through his heart. And you've got a picture of who Mickey is. So Francine and Mickey, they start to see each other. She's attracted to him straight away. And pretty soon, like the horny teenager that Mickey was, he starts to pressure Francine for sex. And she says, no, no, I don't want to do it. She says, I don't really want to do it until I'm married. But he persists, keeps going. Keep saying to her, come on, let's just do it. Keeps trying to touch her up. Every time she says no, he comes back with, come on, let's just do it. Let's just try. Let's just, and she persists with, I'm not doing it until I'm married. So Mickey turns around and says, okay, marry me. I mean, it's such an old tactic. And I can't tell you the number of people who've tried it on with me and I've said the same thing and they've gone, okay, I'm kidding. On. <laughs> that clearly has never happened. <laughs> so he manages to convince Francine that he wants to marry her. And then they have sex. They have sex in the front of his car. How thoroughly romantic. I'll just interject at this point that All of the research that I've done on Francine, every description of her is the exact same. She was a lovely person, a gentle girl who had time for everyone and she was always kind. So here she is with Mickey. She's had sex. And again, this is very reflective of that time. They've had sex, and now the leap is made in Francine and Mickey's mind that what they need to now do is get married. I mean, again, that's <laughs> it's just so reflective of, of what a different time. Can you imagine if that was the case now? For fuck's sake, the world would be a very strange place <laughs> if, if everybody had to marry the first person they ever had sex with. So, he says, let's get married. She says yes. And now, at age 16, she's married to her first and only boyfriend. Let's just look a little more closely at who Mickey was. Who was this guy that the sweet and loving Francine was now in a relationship with? Was he a was he a nice guy? Was he a good guy? No. Mickey had a temper. He had an inner frustration. A sort of constant well of anger in him all the time. Now, before they married, Francine hadn't really seen it. She'd seen little glimpses of it, right? There was the odd moment here and there where he might get overly upset about something. But she just put it down to, oh, he's just a... He's just a hot-headed young man. Fuck's sake, I can be hot-headed. But not in the way that Mickey is hot-headed or in the way that he is going to become. Because what is about to happen to the marriage of Francine and Mickey is sadly a familiar story, but at the same time, completely unique. As a newly married couple, they don't have much money. Mickey doesn't have a job. And so they move in with Mickey's parents. It's not really ideal when you're young, you're just married. You know, you want to spend your time pumping and essentially just getting sexy. It's not really great when you live with your in-laws, but financially, it's what they had to do. (laughs) They had to live with 
Mickey's parents. Pretty soon after they're married, Mickey, he starts to show the side of him that Francine knew was inside of him. The angry man. The man who could just fly off the handle at any moment. One day he comes home and Francine has bought herself a new top. And the new top, it shows a little bit of her cleavage. And the way that it's cut, it shows a little bit of her stomach. And Mickey loses the plot. He goes insane and he tells her to take it off. Now, I said earlier on, Francine was lovely and kind, but that's not to be mistaken with being meek. And she tells Mickey to fuck off, and she says to him, no, I'm wearing this top. And in response to that, he turns really violent. He grabs Francine's hair and he yanks her, throws her to the ground. Francine gets up and she runs into their bedroom. Mickey chases her and when he gets into the bedroom he rips the top off of her body, shouting at her, learn how to behave. I'll just repeat that. Learn how to behave. Immediately after, Francine apologises to Mickey for the top. And she says, I only wanted to look good for you. And he says, I'm sorry, I got angry. It's just that other men will look at you if you wear that kind of top. You're mine. I don't want any other men looking at you. I will add here, and keep this in mind, Mickey's parents are in the next room listening to all of this. This really fascinates me. I just, I think surely his mum or his dad must have felt like maybe they wanted to do something. Step in. Help out. But they didn't. And it continues. It gets worse. Francine can do nothing right. Mickey flies off the handle and he attacks her for the slightest thing. If they're at a party and she happens to glance over at someone, he will beat her black and blue that night, accusing her of looking at someone else. Again, They're still living with his mum and dad. They're listening to this entire thing and they do nothing. So, they're only married a few months and Francine leaves. And that strength, I love that, she goes. She moves back in with her mum and her dad and she says, I'm done with them. I'm over it. So long, Mickey, I am not living this life. But her mother, and again, I'm going to say this one more time in this episode, a sign of the time her mum gives her terrible advice and she says, the men don't mean it and it can't really be that bad. I think you have to go back. Oh my God, I mean, I know it's the time and I know it's the family structure, but come on. While she's away from Mickey, Francine discovers that she is pregnant. And she makes the decision that A, because she's pregnant and B, because everyone else is telling her to do it, she goes back to Mickey. 
it's at this point, I'm not kidding. <laughs> if I had if I had a time machine, <laughs> this is one thing I would do with it. I would go back in time to that moment, find Francine and say, no, don't go back. Don't go back to Mickey because it, it's just going to be disaster from here on in. <laughs> I know people would go back in history and change things like, oh, I would maybe like <laughs> do something to make sure that Hitler was never born or... I, whatever I'm like no I'd go back to that moment with Francine and be like Francine do not go back I, I'm telling you right now but she does and nothing changes Mickey is still a total prick he hits her he verbally abuses her and he makes her feel like a feeble woman even though she's pregnant she's carrying his fucking child and he's still smacking her about at every opportunity. There's a point where she says to him, I would like to go and visit my family. I'd like to go and see my brother. I'd like to go and see my mum. I just kind of want to go and see my family. And he, she says this to him in front of a, a gathering full of people. And he says to her, no, absolutely no way. No, no, no. You are not going to visit your family. You don't need to. And she says, but I really want to go and see my mum. I haven't seen her. And, you know, a couple of months and I'd really like to go and see her and he says no and again this is where you know I think you have to give it to Francine because she does she is strong she says I'm going anyway you can you can say no Mickey but I'm going she tries to leave the house and in front of people while she is six months pregnant he grabs her by the hair he brings her back in to the house pushes her to the ground and he basically kicks her face in so hard that he bursts the blood vessels in her eyes. With a group of people watching this. At that point, Francine decides not to raise the fact that she wants to go and see her family again. It's just not worth it. So Francine gives birth to a baby girl and they call her Christy. Now, with the birth of a child, Mickey tries to get his act together and tries to hold down a job so that they can finally move in to their own home. They're finally free of living with Mickey's parents. So he's working in a factory and he's earning money. So Francine, Mickey and Baby are all living together in their own space for the first time. Does any of this calm Mickey down? No. He's still hitting Francine. He's still slapping her face at social gatherings. He's threatening her that if she ever leaves the house without him, he will beat her when she gets home. He still has this irrational fear that other men are trying to steal her. Now her friends are saying, do not put up with this. And she's just making excuses for him. He's the classic manipulator. It's the classic, I'm going to beat you. I mean, I hate to say that in such a throwaway fashion. Of course, I'm not saying it in a throwaway fashion. But you know what is the classic? I'm going to beat you black and blue. And then what I'm going to do is tell you, I'm really sorry how much I love you. And then everything's everything's fine. We'll go back into the next honeymoon period of everything. Everything will be fine. But that threat is always there. That threat's always building. This is This is entirely what he is operating on at the moment. So life continues for the small family, but pretty soon there is a new addition. Another child is on the way. Francine is pregnant again. By the time that she is pregnant with her second child, Mickey has really increased his drinking and he is even more violent. In the neighbourhood that they live in, the neighbours are fully aware 
of everything that's going on because Mickey would lose the plot and he would literally pull the house apart as the attacker. He would kick furniture over, he would break lamps, he would th- he would pick up like anything that he could find and throw it at her, he would rip things off the wall and he just continually left Francine in these states where her entire face was black and blue and covered in blood. So he's not working at all. And the reason is because he drinks all the time. He cannot hold down a job because he cannot turn up sober to a job. Any money that they have between them, it just goes on alcohol. I mean, the truth is there's actually no money coming into the house at all. Friends, family, people were were trying to give Francine little bits of money here and there that they could because, you know, she had one child, she had another on the way and no money. So Francine decides she needs to do something. So what she does is she goes to apply for welfare and to ask for help. And there's some ridiculous law at this time that says a household can't apply for welfare unless the man in the house signs the forms. So Francine's there and she's like, well, I I, I don't want him to know that I'm having to ask for welfare because that would just cause more problems and I don't know what to do and God bless this wonderful human being at the welfare office who sees the cuts on Francine's face who sees the scars that she's got on her and says you know you could divorce him and Francine is really taken aback and she says, I, I don't know how to, to do that. I don't know how to go about doing that. I can't afford legal fees. I can't afford any of this. And that wonderful human being says to Francine, look, all you need to do is fill out a form. And it's done. It says, you know, you're, you want a divorce. And she says, okay. I want that form. I want away from Mickey. And she's told that the fee is, I think, $10. At which point she says, I don't have $10. I don't have it. I don't have any money. I don't have a penny to my name. And that person in that welfare office pays the fee for Francine to fill out the divorce form. So she fills it out, goes home. Knowing the rage in him and what he's capable of, she still leaves. So does he react well? No, of course not. He beats her absolutely black and blue and he tells her, wherever you go, I I will find you. But she leaves. She gets out of there. So away from him and divorced. She sets up on her own with a lot of help from friends and from family. So now this is a real chance for Francine to be free, to be away from the monster. So she gives birth to the second child and you know she's now a single mum and she does a great job on her own. She sets up a home. She prepares to just have these kids, raise them by herself. But who should knock on her door? Well, Mickey, of course. Again, good work here from Francine. She tells him to go. She says, I'm not interested in getting 
back together. Good, strong. Now we can all agree that that's a strong, proud moment for Francine. But he keeps coming back. He just won't take no for an answer. And when he comes back, he threatens Francine. He's got her now basically into a place where she's living in constant terror of him. Any move that he makes makes her flinch, makes her scared. And he wants sex from her all the time. And she's scared to say no to not having sex. So he keeps coming back. And as strong as she tries to be and not let him into her new house, her new life away from him, she lets him back in every now and then. They have sex. Francine ends up pregnant again. This is now child number three with Mickey. However, she's still living independent of him. Months and months pass. And this really does my head in. So many people are saying to Francine, go back to him. They're all making excuses for Mickey, constantly. Oh, he's, you know, he's better now. He's got a job. He's stopped drinking. So what? He's still the biggest tool going. He's still the biggest fucking tool in the world. Francine, she's got now two young kids. She's pregnant and she is saving every penny in the world that she has to try and make the best of the situation that she's in. But here's what's going to happen next and this is just such an annoying bit of the story. While they are separated, Mickey gets into a car crash and he's pretty badly damaged. So his legs are broken, there's some injuries to his body and he has some head injuries. And when Francine hears about it, she doesn't rush immediately to the hospital. She's in no rush to ever see Mickey. But from the pressure of other people in her life, she agrees that, okay, she will go and she'll visit him in the hospital. After all, they've got two kids, a third on the way. Okay, maybe she should go and see him in the hospital. So she does, they talk, and Mickey, of course, in his hospital bed, says... I'm sorry. I want you back. I didn't mean anything that I did before. Over this time, as her pregnancy develops, she starts thinking, maybe it wouldn't be the worst idea to get back together with Mickey. I know, I know. The collective sound of you all saying, oh God, no, Francine, is deafening. I can hear it. I can hear you saying it. I can hear you saying, no, no, don't do it. Oh God, at this point I just was like, no, Francine, you're doing so well on your own. You've got away. And I know you're about to have your third child, but please understand, you're, you are doing really well. Don't take him back. But she does. Once he's out of the hospital, he moves into Francine's house. Now, he has a bit of a recovery period to go through here. His bones need to heal. 
And the entire time that he's recovering, he makes Francine wait on him hand and foot. Everything. He demands everything of her at every second. And she does it. She gets him everything that he wants. She gives birth to their third child. Mickey's now out of his recovery period and the three of them are living in the house together. The house, which I will say, was Francine's place to escape to. That was her freedom. She's now found herself in a situation where she's living with the man that she escaped from with three kids. Whenever they argue, whatever they fight about, he gets really threatening towards her. And she's still got the guts to stand up to him and she says, look, I've done it once, I will leave you again. And he says, no you won't. Because if you do, I'll find you wherever you go. So for the next few years, this is how they live. Constant beatings. Francine living in total terror all the time. The kids start to grow up. Their first child, by this point, Christy, that first baby girl that they had, is now 12 years old. And this has been 12 years that they have been together. It's it's just... It's just insane that they've been together for 12 years and she's gone away, set up on her own and he's wormed his way back into her life and here they are living together again. Mickey's behaviour towards Francine is awful. He hits her on a daily basis. He flies into a rage over nothing. He continues to just demand sex from her all the time. And she hates sex with Mickey. But refusing it, well, it would probably end in him smashing her off a wall. What she desperately doesn't want at this point is, with three kids and Mickey to deal with, She desperately doesn't want any more children. But because Mickey is so insistent upon sex all the time, she falls pregnant one more time. Oh my God. This is now going to be the fourth child with Mickey. So at this point, I'm just going to tell you about Mickey's mum. You'll remember, this is the mum that they lived with when they were newlyweds, when they had just married. Now, I know mothers love their sons, but this was something insane. So the mother's name is Flossie. Flossie thought that her boy Mickey was just the greatest guy in the world. His mother defended every action that Mickey ever took in his life. If she ever saw Francine with a bruise on her face, a cut lip, scratches in her arms, marks across her head, she blamed Francine. She used to say to her, Francine, don't upset Mickey. Don't upset him. Don't upset my boy. Don't upset my son. Fuck off. There was a night where Mickey went for Francine with a knife ready to stab her. And Francine, she managed to get herself up and out of the situation and she ran to Flossie's house and she said to Flossie, 
he's come at me with a knife. I'm terrified. I'm terrified for my life. I'm terrified for my children. And Mickey's mother's response was, you need to try harder to not upset him. This mother, fucking seriously. Now, you remember that I said at school, Francine was really clever. She was really smart. So she decides that when the four kids are in the world, she's had that fourth baby, she's going to go back to college and she wants to study business. I mean, that's obviously going to be incredibly tricky. She's now got four kids ranging from teenage age through to baby and Mickey to deal with in all of this. But she thinks, no, I want to go back to college. Of course, Mickey hates the idea. He says to Francine, you are too fucking stupid for college. However, she applies and with a government grant, she gets in to college and she starts her studies and she starts to love it. She starts to love being back in a learning environment and she loves just reading her books and studying business and finding things out. She's just, so, you know, it, it really suits her. It really suits her at this point in her life to, you know to be in this place where she's at college and she meets some friends at college this is this is a good position for Francine to be in this is a very good position for her to get herself into but it's not long after starting college that Mickey starts the beatings again out of nowhere out of absolutely nowhere he would grab Francine by the throat and just smash her head against the wall he would say to her I will break your fucking neck don't think I won't kill you bitch I will he'd slap her hard in the face without any warning, any reason. He'd pick up anything that he could find around him and strike her with it. And then, when she was on the floor, he'd take her by her hair and drag her through the house. Now, all the while, their four kids are watching their mother be dragged by her hair around the house. This guy, this prick, my god. Honestly, put me in a fucking room with him. Five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Made me think of him. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about, like, well, it's not, it's not a domestic abuse story, but what's the, what's the one years ago, the, um, was it? I want to say Bobby Bobbit or something his name was. Was that his name? Bo Someday Bobby. No. <laughs> Someday shows your Bobby. Um, what was his name? The, the wife who cut, who cut her husband's dick off because he was having an affair. What was, yeah, what was her name? Winetta, Winetta Bobbit or something. I think he, yeah, he went on to become like a porn star or something. But, and he was, yeah, so he was having an affair and she cut his dick off one night when he was asleep. I'm thinking these vibes <laughs> here. I'm like, just like do something. Just like get this, get this fucker sorted. <sighs> so more and more beatings occur. He chokes Francine at one point. To the point where she almost stops breathing. And she manages to get out of the house and get away from him. She gets into her car and she drives as 
far away as she possibly can. She's driving, driving, driving. And Mickey is following her. In his car. He follows her. And as he gets close to her, he starts to bump her car and try to drive her off the road. So she drives to a police station and she tells police what has happened. Now, she's obviously in an absolutely shockingly terrible state. But she's given a... Oh, sorry, there's not really much that we can really do in this situation because, unfortunately, we didn't see it happen. Oh, come on. He's trying to kill her. Why Why is nobody helping in this situation? And this is something that's really tragic about this story and about this time, is that actually, if you called police to report a domestic abuse incident, unless police had actually seen a man hit a woman, nothing could be done. And almost... In a way, the most shocking thing about it is that men knew this. They knew this. If you weren't caught in the act of the violence, you just, there would be no punishment. There just would not be a punishment. Francine, again, just doesn't, she doesn't just lie down and take it. She tries to run. She tries again. There's a point where she gets all the kids packed up in the car and she tries to escape. And just before she can leave, he gets to the car, he opens the car door, and he drags her out by her hair. And he beats her so violently in the front garden that a neighbour calls the police. The beating lasts for 20 minutes. And when police arrive, Francine is lying in a pile of blood with broken ribs and a barely recognisable face. Like I just said, police, they didn't see the beating. So actually, there's no punishment for Mickey. He gets taken away. He gets a fine over something it's something stupid like he was cheeky to a police officer or you know in the back of the car he hit a police officer when he was in a rage nothing he gets no punishment for that attack upon Francine feel free to scream your head off because that is honestly how I feel oh <sighs> Mickey has taken his violent rages beyond just Francine. As well as the continual abuse of her, it's begun to spiral over into their children. And he's now begun to beat them on a regular basis. The kids live in constant fear of their dad because they never know how he's going to react. They never know if they're saying the right thing. If they're behaving in the right way, they just never know. Because at any moment, he might just flip the fuck out. So police are now coming on a regular basis. Because, see, although I'm saying to you, police can't do anything unless they see it. It doesn't stop Francine from constantly calling the police. And I suppose that they're in a bit of a cat and mouse, cat and mouse game in this situation where... He'll start an attack. She'll call police. She knows that police, when they come, can't do anything unless they see an attack. But what she's also doing with those phone calls is letting him know that she's actually going to keep calling them until the point where they can do something about it. But all that they ever do is give him a little light slap in the wrist and say, oh, you better behave. Oh, just uh, just you calm that drinking down no, nothing ever really happens so she's still trying to go to college when she can and like I said she'd made some friends there but it's really you know and again it's another admiration point really for her she's walking in 
to a busy college into these classes and she has burst lips. She's got black eyes. She's got clumps of her hair pulled out. We're going to go to March 7th, 1977. And this is the point where the story reaches its climax and makes it a truly unforgettable story. It's a usual night at home. Francine's there. Mickey's there. The four kids are there. Mickey is incredibly drunk. And he decides that on this night, he's going to let Francine know just how much he hates her going to college. And how he does this is he takes Francine's books from school and he starts to, at first, just open the books and he rips pages out, tosses them onto the ground. A page here, a page there, throws the book down. Then he says he wants to take it further and what he does is he puts all of her college books into the middle of the kitchen floor. He lights a match and he sets fire to the books. He turns to her and he says, well, I guess you won't be going to school anymore. Francine is devastated and she begs him to stop. But, book by book, he throws them all. Onto the fire in the kitchen. Until they're burned. He gets water and he puts the fire out and he grabs her by the throat. And he says, if you think about going back to college again, I will kill you. <sighs> to add to the fucking horror of this situation, he takes her head and he smashes her face off the floor so that she is covered in blood. And he tells her, clean up the burned books. Put them all in the bin outside this house and then make me my dinner. As she makes him dinner in the kitchen, he circles her. He comes close to her at certain points. He breathes on her neck. And if at any point she flinches, he laughs and then slaps her really hard across the face. He continues to drink and drink and at this point he's going round the kitchen and he's just picking up anything he can find and he's throwing it on the floor. So a glass bottle, throwing it down on the ground and saying to her, clean it up now. So she'd stop making his dinner, she would go, she would clean up the bottle. As soon as it was clean, he'd pick something else up, throw it on the ground and tell her, clean that up. He takes a bottle of beer at the fridge at one point and before opening it, he smacks it across her face and bursts her lip open. Francine is crying at this point and she's shouting for him to stop. And the kids, they're shouting down from upstairs and they're asking if she's okay. Can they, can they help? Can they come down? And he shouts back up to his own kids that if they ask again if their mother is okay, he will come up there and he will make them sorry. Hmm. So Mickey goes upstairs to the bedroom to eat his dinner that Francine has made him. And when he's finished, he shouts for Francine to come up to the bedroom. She goes into the bedroom and he is lying on the bed with his trousers undone. He is expecting sex. 
His exact words were, how about a little? I mean, this is so tragic. This is so tragic. But she, she knows at this point that if she says no, it's another fucking knife held to her throat. Or the kids get attacked. Or he breaks her ribs again. It's just another round of this if she says no to sex. So, she has sex with him. He falls asleep. After sex. And Francine goes back downstairs. Now, we all have our breaking point. Every one of us. Every one of us has it. And Francine's has arrived. Along with her breaking point also comes, and these, I love these moments in life. There's a really beautiful moment of clarity for Francine. And this is what it is. She realises that the years of abuse, the psychological terror, the watching her kids live in fear, the burning of her college books, and the fact that this was never going to change, all in that moment comes in to clarity for Francine. And what she does next, when that moment has arrived, will always be remembered and will be her legacy. Francine goes down to the cellar of the house. She finds a can of petrol that they used to use for the lawnmower. She goes up to the kids and she says to them, get dressed and go to the car now. Once they're in the car, she creeps into the bedroom. Mickey is lying asleep on the bed, passed out, drunk. And she pours the petrol that she's found around the bed where he sleeps. With the kids in the car and with all of the strength that she can find, Francine Hughes lights a match and she sets fire to the bed in which Mickey sleeps. She runs immediately to the car. Her kids are there and she drives off. As she leaves, the fire explodes through the house and the whole house begins to burn down. She drives straight to a police station And when she gets there, she says, I did it. I killed him. I did it. She explains to the police the story of her life and what she's just done. The fire services get called to the house and they do their best to extinguish the fire. The fire is put out. And when firefighters go in to the bedroom, they find Mickey's dead body still in the bed. He had died from a combination of smoke inhalation and severe burning to his body. So now the trial begins. And of course, this is really difficult. Essentially, what we've got here on our hands is a woman who has burned her husband to death. And the charge is first degree murder. So if you're just looking at that really from the outside, if you don't know any of Francine's story, if you don't know what that relationship is, the headlines will tell you, women sets fire to husband while he sleeps in bed. And... You know, that just makes her look like she's some crazy murderess who just wants to set fire to her husband. She just wants rid of her husband, so she thought, oh, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just set fire to him while he's in his bed. 
Again, remembering what time we're in, this is the 1970s and the courts and police, they, they weren't particularly lenient on women who cried domestic abuse. A man could beat the living hell out of his wife and not be arrested. So how the hell is a woman who has burned her husband to death going to cope or fear? in the justice system. During the trial, lots of witnesses are called to talk about their experience of what they witnessed between Francine and Mickey. Now, one of them is Flossie, Mickey's mum. She sits in court and, oh, she lies her face off. She says, no, I never saw Mickey be violent. She says they were just a couple who argued like any other couple. I never saw any violence. You lying witch. Liar, liar, mother on fire. Because it's just lies. And I know you want to protect your own kids. But if your child, if your son was that monster... How can you sit there and say, no, I never, I never saw anything because you saw it all. She saw every bruise, every cut on Francine's face and just sat there and she tells such a load of lies. She blames Francine in court, but it doesn't really help the case against Francine. It just seems like an unhinged woman in court trying to defend her son. So actually, it kind of goes against Mickey. It really, it you know what I mean? She ends up actually painting him in quite a bad light without really knowing that she's doing it. Francine's kids have to testify. Oh, it's just horrible. The oldest one, Christy, has to sit and be cross-examined about the beatings and just has to describe what she saw and she has to talk about the fact that she saw her dad drag her mum through the house by her hair and that her mum's face was always bleeding and you know she has to talk about what it was like to live with her dad what she describes as terrifying so the evidence it's all presented and the jury rests It takes two days, but eventually the jury come back with their verdict and Francine waits to hear her fate. By this point, there are hundreds of women standing outside of the court where this is happening with placards that read Free Francine Let women speak Placards that say things like There must be an end to violence in the home But that's all well and good What are a jury going to decide? The jury find Francine not guilty of first degree murder on the grounds of temporary insanity. The jury have agreed that Francine was pushed to a point that no human being should ever be pushed to and that in a moment of madness she lit that fire around the bed. Francine is free to leave with her kids and start her life away from Mickey all over again. And so ends, sort of, but not really, (laughs) the story. I say doesn't end the story because 
it was really the Francine Hughes case it really was just the start of a bigger discussion this case I mean it threw domestic abuse into the limelight in the most incredible way suddenly you know people were writing to Francine and saying I've been going through this for years my mother lived like this for years people were really coming out and going this is also my story I too am in a relationship where I am utterly miserable and live in constant fear of my partner there was a book written called The Burning Bed and it sold millions and public awareness was growing really fast really really fast Francine was asked to talk about her experience and she did loudly and proudly she made people in the same situation feel like it was okay to stand up and say yes I am in an abusive relationship in the year that this case happened I find this utter it's brilliant it's so brilliant I just find it utterly shocking in Michigan where this all happened in Michigan alone the number of battered women's shelters went from two to 706. I mean, that's insane. The rise of places where women could go if they felt they were abused in their home, to go from two to 706 is just fucking incredible. But not just in Michigan. Something was changing at a ground level where people felt like, yes, we need to have this conversation. Now we need to open this up and go, actually, there are women who need to get away from the life that they're living in and feel safe. But it was also happening at a top level. No longer were police coming to houses and seeing a woman bleeding with black eyes and not doing anything. The men were being held accountable. The Francine Hughes case made domestic violence one of these things that people could just not pretend anymore that they weren't seeing. In this story, I mean, it's, it's awful because Flossie, Mickey's mother, she is the person who saw it all and just pretended it didn't exist. But it took her son being burned alive in a bed for her to actually see that if you subject a person to 13 years of torture, there is a breaking point. Of course there is a fucking breaking point. Okay, I'll wind this story up now. In brief, Francine went on to live her life, she raised her four kids. I don't think Francine's life beyond this was perfect. So she trained as a nurse and she remarried. Now, lots of reports will tell you that Francine took to drinking quite heavily, taking some drugs, and that her four kids have all, in their own way, gone off the rails. They've all had their own misdemeanours in life. They've all not necessarily ended up on the straight and narrow. When I look at that, I think I I can kind of understand it because, like I said in the beginning, this this is that it it is quite unique. Domestic violence isn't unique. Domestic violence isn't unique. But Francine's story is, so I can understand how her kids might have been so badly affected by it that they've that their own lives need a bit of meaning that you know their own lives have spiraled into something else and that you know she herself you don't just you're not telling me that <laughs> Francine <laughs> just walked away from that court case and went oh well that's it well you know I've been found uh, not guilty he's dead 
everything's fine. No, of course not. You know, there's years of abuse and torture in her head that, that that's never going to change. And her kids grew up watching it and seeing it, so they also lived through it. Francine died of pneumonia in 2016, but I think the really important thing to remember is that, yeah, maybe her life spiralled out of control towards the end, but Francine Hughes, for me, stands as such an important figure, because I think that story really awakens people to something that cannot, cannot be something that we just pretend we don't see. It can't. I know this is a touchy subject. I know that, um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. It's not easy. But, you know, my philosophy in life, just because it's not easy, doesn't mean you should avoid it. This wasn't any... I wavered on telling this story. I really was like, oh, God, I don't know if I want to, like, open up that world. But, you know, once I got even just the slightest little hint of it, I was like, no, this woman, I I need to tell her story. Because I have so much respect for her. I know that ultimately there, there will be other people that other people but there will be people who are on the side who go well at the end of the day she still killed a man she still actually lit a man on fire but it's all about context for me I'm not saying murder's okay I would never say murder's okay but I'm saying in this circumstance in this one circumstance I'd be hard pushed, I think, to not stand with Francine in that moment. Because there just was no other way for her to escape. How was she ever going to get out of it? The time was never going to allow her to get out of it. And yes, those actions were drastic. But that's when someone is at the absolute edge of desperation. That's at a point where someone has got nothing else that they can actually do. So anyone who would say, okay, yeah, but she still killed a man, she still did this, I would then say back to that, have you ever been at the point where you just didn't know another way out? When you had been subjected to that almost daily for 13 years I don't know it's thorny, it's difficult alright well (laughs) get in touch give me your thoughts, I'm sure you will and I'd love to hear them so if you want to get me, you can there is of course the wonderful Facebook group growing in strength all the time it's, I talk about it all the time, it's a wonderful environment. Just, just get yourself on. Even if you're one of these people like, I was a bit like this, mm, I don't really know if I like Facebook groups, oh, I don't want to be kind of constantly bombarded with things. You won't be, you'll love it. You'll feel like, you'll feel amazing if you join the group, I promise you, you will. It's the place to be. But also, if you're not a Facebooker, there's Instagram, there's Twitter. You can email me, Extraordinary Stories Podcast, at gmail.com. And if you want to support the podcast, you can help me out by going on to Patreon, finding me. You'll also find episodes that I don't release elsewhere on Patreon. So I'm there. It's Extraordinary Stories Podcast. I think you have to put it all in as one word because I've fucked up my settings at some point. Don't quite know how I did that, but I've done it. Um, But you'll find me. You'll find me on Patreon if you would like to support the podcast. That would be amazing. All right. Until the next short stories episode, 
ok goodbye it didn't it didn't affect me really one way or the other <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.